Hi guys and welcome, Nembon here. In today's video I will be presenting a very survival friendly and relatively simple to build nether fortress farm that doesn't suck. On the contrary, it would provide you with up to 8000 blaze rods per hour, which if you would have blaze spawners it would be equivalent of having 8 of them at the same time, 5000 coal, 10,000 bones, 4000 gold nuggets with extra 100 ingots per hour to spare, a little bit of useless rotten flesh and arrows, far less from the typical overworld mob farm, and obviously on top of that 3 wither skulls per minute, which would mean that you could make a beacon for every minute you run this farm. It's also extremely lag effective, using typically only about 10-15% to of the game resources, meaning if you run it on a server nobody would complain about the lag you are not causing, and also doesn't use any glitches in the game or any questionable components like various mob conveyors, which tend to break literally from version to version, all which would hopefully make a design that could be used in the future without any major changes. This is not necessarily guaranteed, but at least we can do as much as we can to keep it intended. So let me walk you through the iterations of this design, because I thought it shows quite nicely how simplifying the design can make it much more effective. So what is the rationale behind this design? The effectiveness of wither skeleton farms, or fortress farms in general, can vary greatly, from a fraction of a skull per minute to some ridiculous numbers. I would here recommend to check TT's recent wither skeleton farm with over 14.5 skulls per minute output, so it's quite obvious it is very easy to screw it up or make it decently fast often at a huge building cost and complexity. On the opposite, if we look for example at witch farms, it is very easy to make a simple design that achieves 90% efficiency, because witch farms are capped at a certain output mainly due to their smaller size, and the differences between decent designs are pretty much academic and not important in practice. But that's definitely not the case for the fortress farms. Also unlike general purpose hostile mob farms, most loot from fortress farms is actually very useful in practice. Blaze rods as a cheap and accessible fuel, coal as fuel as well as trading material to find your best smith villagers, gold which if you need it you typically need large amounts of it, bones there is no need to tell the reasons to farm these and obviously with their skeleton skulls. So let's go back to the beginning where I presented this farm that started the whole idea of the fun farm series, which aim was to remove the dependency on a questionable shifting floor exploit, adding an open fence gate which allowed the design to actually work, up to this day. Unfortunately it's very expensive, complex to build and sucked big times, not because it didn't have enough spawning spaces, no 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 no, mainly due to the fact that a player had to manually run from skeleton to skeleton to kill them one by one, which would open new spaces in the mob cap for new mobs to spawn, and that's typically the main limitation of this kind of design. So the mandatory requirement for today's design is the fact that all the mobs have to end up in one place, not only because it's easier to automate it and make it more convenient to use, but also it is a requirement for better rates. Also this farm was designed around a quad 2x2 of nether crossroad, which is not necessarily a big issue as you can force nether mobs to spawn on nether brick in the entire bounding box of the fortress, but there is one reason which I'll be talking about where crossroad location is actually beneficial. So I'll be initially looking at the quad crossroad configuration, but the resulting farm, spoilers, will only be using a single one, making it feasible design in virtually any nether fortress, as the generation of any fortress starts with a mandatory crossroad. So here was the first attempt, and not surprisingly it is using slime block sweepers. If you had a chance to see my sugarcane farm, which was episode 13 of the series when I was presenting it, I was saying sugarcane but my brain was thinking with their skeleton skulls, thankfully, because it was all scripted like this one, it didn't slip off my tongue, Who? And I knew a decent wither skeleton farm with this technology would require much more care, so I decided to take my time with this design. So what we have here is uh, three floors of swipers covering a 2x2 two two intersection, however, as I mentioned, this very farm could be built in any nether fortress location, replacing red nether brick with regular nether bricks at the same effect. Okay, not the same, but I'll come back to this later, so don't worry. The primary set of requirements for this farm, which in turn dictated the mode d'emploi, is as follows. We are using simple spawning floors and we use simple bidirectional slime block swipers to bring the mobs to the center row first, and then use a secondary swiper system to bring them all to the player that AFK is below the center of the farm, where he can apply looting to the farm casualties, increasing the drop rates of the farm to a very decent amount. 
It's not the new concept, as slimebox vipers were used in wither skeleton farms in the past, way before simple observer flying machines, but these observer-based flyers make them not only very cheap and easy to build, but also extremely lag-friendly, at least for what is really important, which is for the core gameplay engine. And if you are using Optifine as your client, it would be also a smooth sailing across the board. Achieving 200 ticks per second, which means we are only using about 10% of the available game resources, is typical for this approach. Right off the bat, uh, first observation to deal with the most annoying mob of them all, the magma slimes. Cobblestone walls are woven in between spawning spaces in a typical pattern that prevents to spawn anything wider than one block. In this case it means that no large and no medium magma slimes can spawn. They are simply annoying as heck, as they require extra carrying, larger drop shoots, which we don't want to pay for, they don't want to die from fall damage and they are just plain ugly. The upside of dealing with them this way is they don't occupy the mob cap, meaning we can have other mobs spawning in their place. The downside of the cobble walls is we cannot use spawning floor made of non-sticky blocks and run the swipers on the floor, because it would all stick to at least the cobble walls. But it turns out it's not that big of a deal at the end. The only thing we cannot control and prevent or spawn is small magma slimes, as well as baby pigmen, which would also be unaffected by the slime rock swipers. The solution? Very simple. We don't care. This means that the AFK spot not only have to be located 24 blocks away from the spawning platforms, but we need to lower it by extra 8 blocks, which is 32 blocks away, so all the tiny annoying guys are able to despawn on their own. So that the extra distance is actually the biggest repercussion of our decision of not caring about the small little buggers. So let's look at the slime swipers. Initially I had half of them, and they were going back and forth from one end to the other, as you might imagine, this was taking ages to get all the mobs collected. So I designed a simple and flat return station that can blend well with the wall. The idea is you would have this flat, one wide impenetrable wall, and we don't have the small guys hiding inside of them, and we can still run flying machines into them being able to return them. On the other side, in the farm area, the swipers run actually into the wall so no mobs can actually get stuck on them. And as you can see, the swipers on all floors are triggered with a delay, so the reason is that if we push the mobs uh, from all the platforms, we want all of them, especially blazes, to arrive at the crushers, which are below, roughly at the same time. Here we have a circuit that allows to detect when the swipers arrive and detect so that the crusher is triggered only when the swipers are going in with the mobs, not out. And then what crushers do, they would release first the previous batch of wither skeletons and then let other mobs fall into it. At this point are all two high mobs like zombie penguin blazes and normal skeletons are crushed, leaving behind just the wither skeletons. The idea with the early crusher, so we can re get rid of blazes and pigments early on, so we can free up the mob cap for other mobs to spawn. After crashing, the wither skeletons arrive to this bottom channel where we have this U-shaped swiper that brings them all to the middle, still into this three wide hole, and then the signal is sent to the bottom to place them in a one by one so that the AFK player can sweep them all at once, roughly at the time when they arrive. As I said, the design is really straightforward and very clean, but it has its issues. As you can see eventually, it will start leaking little guys, so magma cubes and baby pigment, however, the size is not that much of a problem, you can seal them. But we have an issue with the swiper area. As magma cubes don't take fall damage, we need to install some cacti to deal with them in this area around here. And that's not a biggie, the, what is a big issue is the performance of this farm. You can see we are getting about 2000 wheel skeletons per hour, which uh, we need about 1100 per hour mob wise to claim one wither skull per minute. So at this point we are making about 1.8 wither skulls per minute. And that's it. What's even more important is the field mob cap ratio, which is extremely high, indicating that 80% of the time the game doesn't spawn any mob because the mob cap of 70 mobs is already full. This gives a very clear indication that to get more spawns we shouldn't be aiming for more spawning spaces and making the farm larger, but rather to make it smaller, so it can take less time to bring the existing mobs right to the player. And I'm really glad we have this tool here, the carpet mod, because otherwise it would be just a guessing game. So here's the next iteration. I cut down significantly on the path that swipers have to take. In fact, instead of a square shape, we have now a 2x1 rectangle, twice as longer on the one edge. What this made is the fact that it now takes roughly the same time for the swiper on the spawning floors to bring mobs to the middle as it takes the bottom swiper to bring them to the player. All in all, we cut significantly on the spawning spaces, furthest away from the collection, making the farm faster. 
The entire farm is now sealed, so no small mobs can escape it, and I installed a simple cactus trap at this point, where these little buggers were previously escaping from the farm. So that's all good, and it solves the issue 100%. On the sides we can see a simplified swiper detectors to trigger the crashers. It uses observers, great improvement, I mean it's, it's the same thing, it's just more compact and smaller. The results, much better rates, but still way too big, the mobcap fill factor still is in the upwards of 30-40%, so we can still make it smaller and faster and simpler and get better rates at the same time. Isn't that tiny? Isn't that cute? I shrinked out the side platforms from 4 by 12 of those cobblestone wall sections to 3 by 5 and finally mobcap filled in a single digit percentages which means that this can actually be the starting point to continue with the farm. And this is already a decent farm at 2.4-2.5 skulls per minute and very simple. And it turned out that the spawning area now matches pretty well a bounding box of a single intersection meaning that we can build it in absolutely any fortress using any material you want. And this will be important because we will be eventually swapping these spawning places for something more effective. Due to the radical shrinkage we just need one slime block swiper. On the edge I just realized you don't need the observers and the entire direction detection of the swipers. You just need one observer and that's enough. I also moved the controls to start and stop the pushers to the center and it's not the final version of it yet but moving them to the inside saved quite a bit on the rest of the cables and made the farm look more compact. And still the middle part is one block wide. For now the on off switch is here on the top but I'll be moving it down for convenience to the player when the rates are good enough. At the trench I have flipped the pusher upside down so now it's not the U shape but the N shape or M shape like here which makes it so now it's possible for the magma cream to fall through. It's simple change by the great benefits. It means uh, if I was one block high I could try to jump here on the slime block here and try to cut the opening over there. But since slimes jump from the spawning floors their momentum is towards the center so they won't do it. And from my extensive testing with this one I have never seen any of these little buggers outside anymore. So we can save all this clumsy cactus setup. And then we have probably the biggest simplification of it all. There is no crusher. It was beneficial to have it in the first slow farm, getting rid of the other mobs was helping the race tremendously, but now around 3 skulls per minute it's not an improvement anymore. It takes on average less time for a mob to get pushed and fall down, even blazes, than to take this 10 seconds here wait for blazes and pigment to suffocate. Great simplification with this one, and as a bonus you can get all the drops from all the mobs that the player kills, and all multiplied typically by 2.5 times because of looting. So great, not only we have a useless fast wither skeleton farm, who needs one beacon per minute anyways, if you could eat it like a bacon maybe, but you also get other useful stuff like bones, blazers, cold and gold, which is awesome. So let me show you now two more things you can do to increase school drop rates with this design, which I specifically didn't put to the final product, but you're welcome to do it if you want. First is quite obvious, is to replace the pusher in the middle with something faster like a mob conveyor or like in this case it's like stairs for mobs. The reason being you still need mobs to go down and if you observe the blazes it feels like their fall is not that badly interrupted by the fact we are pushing them into the middle. Added an extra 4th floor for spawning because we spend much less time right now on dropping into this one spot, so judging by the mob cap fullness rates adding one more floor simply increase the rates to 3.5, possibly up to 4 schools per minute, uh, rather than just increase the mob cap fullness. The issue I had with this one, sometimes mobs get caught on the slime box mechanism and that's just my sloppy design, I bet many of you wrestling artists would be able to come up with something tighter but it increased the perceived lag quite significantly, from almost no effect on the CPU, regardless of the farm is running or not, or I can see the difference, and it's also quite loud, which I don't particularly like. I mean from the player position we wouldn't be able to hear the pushers on the spawning platform, they're just too far, but we would definitely be able to hear mobs being pushed going down the hill on this conveyor. But the main reason is fast mob conveyors were never really well supported or intended by the game. And I would really like this one to be a simple farm that I would like to stay functional for a couple of versions. And the only thing really we are relying on is those simple observer flying machines. So mob conveyor, yeah, for sure, great improvement. Even the mob downward accelerator. But I wouldn't do it honestly just from the pure future compatibility reasons. Another possibility is to add pretty much for free a two high mob filters on the outer edges of the platforms, letting zombies and blazes simply fall down to the cacti below and die this way. Especially that it would deal with these mobs that spawned on the outside of the slime block pushers, making their life considerably quicker, because they don't have to go back and forth on the platforms to get to the middle. 
Like with the use of the mob conveyor, the improvements are actually clearly visible, easily 3.5 scores per minute, but as a downside we are missing half of the gold and half of the braze rods, and I don't think honestly it's worth it. Oh, and these balconies out here? This actually is a genuine improvement that requires a tiny experiment to show what's going on. So we are here in the same perimeter as before, or is it? It is actually, I just filled it all with solid blocks. The reason is, we need to do a test on a very small scale, and in an empty perimeter we can only speed up spawning 10 times due to how spawning algorithm works. It will essentially hit the air blocks all the time, which makes the spawning algorithms run quite inefficiently. And if you fill the perimeter with solid blocks all the way, like in this case, we can actually ramp up the spawning 500 times the norm. And what I'll be testing here is what are the spawn rates of mobs on a single spot depending on the mob spawning composition around it. In this case, for example, we are within the bounding box of a fortress component, and all the spots here spawn fortress mobs regardless of what we have below. And I'll be using this as a reference point. And here above, we are inside the large bounding box of the fortress, but outside of the fortress section area, like the intersection. And we'll be also tracking spawning on one spot, but in this case, we can change the spawn list uh, by manipulating the block below the neighboring box. Here are a couple of things that can happen. Either changing the mob composition of the spawns around it won't affect the spawn rates of our signal out spot, which I highly doubt knowing how pack spawning works. Second option is we'll be getting less mobs but still the same ratio between them. Or we'll be getting more pigment as this is the only significant mob that spawns in both areas. To test it is easy. I have the player in a proper range and a single spawning spot with a certain number of spawning spaces around sharing the same spawn list. What I need to do now is we are running carpet mod is turn mocking on, spawn mocking true, which would disable mob appearing in the world, but it will keep the spawning algorithm running so we can still track it. Increase spawn rates like uh, 500 times, and then use spawn tracking to monitor the mobs that would spawn in this place. And after a certain time we will be able to check the spawning report indicating what would spawn in that signal out spot multiplied by 500 times. And here are the results based on how large the ring is, or rather the square of extra nether brick spots around the test spot. And it turns out that the lack of spawning uh, locations around the testing block doesn't make it spawn more pigment percentage wise, which is interesting. But what is obvious is that the lack of spots with the same spawn composition makes a single spot spawn about 40% of the mobs that could spawn on the spot if it was all surrounded by nether brick. And this effect can be observed for up to 5 6 block out easily. This means that, especially in one of those super high speed farms where spawning spaces are isolated from each other, surrounded by redstone to move the mobs uh, in and out as quick as possible, adding extra nether brick blocks at the same level as the spawning spaces may increase the rates up to 250%, which would mean that the farm not only could spawn more mobs, but can be potentially smaller as well. So here is my idea of this kind of a spawning pad. If we assume that the player AFK is almost 180 blocks above that, we could easily filter out wither skeletons from other mobs, like this one, and let the other ones just spawn almost instantly, just falling outside of the 128 block area, and just simply collect wither skeletons from this area. I don't know if we would have enough spawning spaces to fill up the mob cap with this design, but definitely the spawning spaces are not at 100% spawning potential because they are not surrounded by extra nether bricks blocks. So while the spotting space in the middle of the fortress is at 100%, an isolated spot outside will spawn about 43% of the mobs. I thought I would test out some other common scenarios. A spot surrounded by extra blocks, one more gives 51%, 2, 62%, 3, 77, 4, 88%, 5 blocks away, 94%, 6 blocks away, 96, 7 blocks away, 98, 8 blocks away, 99. A spot on a one wide strip of blocks is 49%, in the middle of a three wide strip is 65%, on the side of the strip is 63%, and on the corner of the platform is 60%. Now in the fortress section area using a cobblestone wall pattern gives about 90% of original spawns, but it's just because of much reduced spawn chances for magma cubes, so this becomes the reference point. The rates of wither skeletons and other one wide mobs are exactly the same. Outside of the section area, the same pattern gets 85% spawn, so only 5% less. On the corner of such platform, we'll get 53%. And if we use other blocks to prevent magma cubes from spawning while keeping the nether brick floor, we are back at 90%. From this, we can also calculate the spawning rates per spawning space, which also depend on number of subchunks with active spawning at or around the spawning spot. 
In this test, I filled up the world up to Y42 with solid blocks, which means 9 active subchunks. If you would not remove any bedrock for the farm, you would always have 9 active subchunks because that's where the nether ceiling ends. And to get to the other numbers, you can just scale it appropriately for the number of active subchunks. But since most of the nether fortresses start at Y48, if you remove all the bedrock above the farm, you can go as low as 4th subchunks up to Y62 with your spawning spaces. Which means that your spawning spaces will be a little bit over 2 times more effective than with the normal nether. From that knowing how fast is your farm, you can calculate mob spawn rates and minimum required number of spawning spaces to fill up the mob cap. So let's look at the following example. Let's assume we deal with a single player mob cap of 70 mobs and about 22 seconds of average mob lifetime, from first spawn attempt to last tick of death animation. The total number of mobs per hour in this farm is just 70 times 3300 divided by 22 which is 11.5 thousand. Since Wither Skeletons form 29% of the bunch, this gives about 3300 of them and 3 skulls per minute, as we need roughly about 1100 skeletons per hour to get 1 skull per minute. To have these 11.5 thousand mobs to spawn, assuming a full fortress area, we have 14.4 mobs per spawning spot per hour, which gives about 800 minimum required spawning spaces in 9 subjunks with the regular bedrock nether cover. In our case, we have about 900 spawning spaces in the first 3 floors. 200 I added on the 4th floor and about 150 on the top one. Assuming all swipers block about 30 spawning spaces at all time each, we have 10 of these uh, swipers. This gives us an active number of spawning spaces of about 950, which nicely matches this here setup. This means that our farm has a really good balance of number of spawning spaces, so the size of the farm to the expected output of the farm. We can reverse these formulas if you want, for example to get a crazy 20 skulls per minute, we would need to spawn per hour 22,000 wither skeletons, or let them call tall guys for short, which gives 77,000 total spawned mobs. So assuming all of the other ones, which is 71% of them, die in 2 seconds, and 55% of tall guys manages to pick up the pumpkin within 2 seconds from spawning as well, this gives the required regular tall guys lifetime of 11.5 seconds. And to do that, with bedrock removed, so the fourth sub chunk, we will need about 2400 spawning spaces, assuming they have a full pack spawning support, so they are at 100% spawning efficiency. I don't know if that's doable, it's, that's just the math behind it. So that explains why we have these balconies around the farm. So if you look at any spawning spaces, I tried to have as many solid nether brick blocks around them within 11x11 11 11 area as it was reasonable. The red area is something absolutely minimum and required to see the differences, and the black edges, since they are getting farther and farther away, they are not that important as much. So if it bothers you or makes the overall design bulky, you can always make it smaller and don't use these blocks. All the areas not meant for spawning is spawn proofed with collidable blocks like carpets, slabs or glass. The reason is simple, the AFK player will also be killing zombie pigmen and if you don't want zombie reinforcements to spawn, and unfortunately they abide by different spawning rules and things like redstone or rails don't make them spawn proof, the only blocks that would work in this case are just non-solid blocks, as reinforcements can spawn on any solid and dark block, including the bedrock. The three main uh, spawning floors fit almost perfectly in a single 19x19 19 19 bounding boss of another crossroad. Our pads are 17 blocks across, which are just 2 blocks short, and whatever sticks out of the length department is covered with the nether brick. 4th and 5th floors are added just because mob cap wasn't full enough. Without them, the farm would produce about 2.6 skulls per minute, with still some room in the mob cap. The 4th floor brought it up to 2.85, and the 5th floor adds an extra 0.15 at the cost of 2 more swipers. So, if you are considering building it yourself, feel free to cut down on the, these 2 extra floors if you want. As you can notice, they are getting progressively shorter, as the mob path to the player, mainly blazes, fall, is getting longer and longer, and with the full 5 floors, I was actually getting worse results than with the basic 3. So that's quite interesting. Obviously, since we are above the crossroad structure, we need to use nether brick across the board here. So why packed ice? Good question. When mobs get hit by slime blocks and happen to be on ice, and they are not on the collision course with the cobble fences and other mobs, there is actually a high chance that they will land directly in the hole without the need of being pushed again. So that makes it faster, and actually that was the rationale to make the spawning pass that particular width. So it's just enough for the mobs to be pushed right in the middle from the other side. 
The area marked with the ice blocks is covered by a single nether intersection, so 19 by 19. But in most typical cases, you will have other nether forces components attached to it anyways. So if you can verify that these spots are also getting fortress mobs to spawn, you can replace these spots with packed ice as well. You could also notice these leaf blocks uh, sticking out from the back wall uh, that block the spawning spaces. And the reason is that sometimes mob can get stuck in between pistons in the engine of the flying machines and the pusher simply drags them back and forth until they despawn or suffocate. Which is not what we want and these extra leaf blocks prevent that and they just make them unstuck. Also the engines of pushers on both sides are positioned in between the cobble fences because it turns out unless they are hit by a slime block they won't be able to get pushed over fences by normal blocks like pistons on observers. So that turned out to be required as well. As you're at it, the on-off switch uses two sets of pistons that removes not only the detection observer, but also breaks the connection to the piston to return to the flying machine. And that's so you wouldn't be able to break the flying machine just by turning it on and off in a very unfortunate moment, which was the possibility before, with removing just the observer alone. Because removing it, it will trigger the observing pistons which may actually crash the slime block machines if they just come at the wrong moment. The global on-off switch for the farm is actually pretty straightforward. I just made a simple torch tower from the player position to the top that turns on all the mechanical components of the farm. One thing to note, with this farm on, these torches will be lit, uh, so a little bit of uh, shielding was necessary to make the light doesn't creep into the farm area. As you can see, even the lowest of light levels reduces chances for wither skeletons to spawn a little bit, so we have to make sure it's completely dark. I also added a little bit of delay between these three main floors, so sweepers don't send out mobs in waves. This helps to actually to smooth out the mob cap fullness. As you can also notice, after much testing I ditched the entire synchronization between the floor pushers and the bottom pusher. It just turned out that it actually is better to run it separately on its own clocks, just to get the mobs tiny bit faster to the player. Similar ice trick has been employed in the bottom pushers when I used beds on ice blocks instead of hay bales. Just be very careful with the beds when placing them. Best is to wait with them to the very end of the build because if you accidentally click on them, you would have to do it all and all again. The benefits of the beds is that they will cushion the fall of the mobs as you still have a long way to go and we need to deliver them alive to the player. On top of that, the slime blocks don't stick to them and unlike the hay bales, they also spawn proof the bottom pusher area as well. Then instead of having a 3x1 drop shoot to the player, I decided to add the simple pistons to push the mobs into a 1x1 hole at the very top. So we have a little trip wire and most mobs trigger it, which places them directly in the drop shoot area right away. But in rare cases mobs can get stuck, but within seconds they will be pushed again via this clock. And that's the only clock in this farm, at least for the spawning area. The collection is over here and the player sits on the slab, here being just far enough from the spawning area so that the magma cubes and baby pigment can despawn on their own. And that's it in terms of the farm really, you just need to sit here and use your sword and just swipe the mobs as they come in. As I mentioned the on-off switch is actually safe to disable or enable the farm at any point as long as we are not flicking the lever quickly for no reason we should be all fine. As usual with flying machines the farm needs to be turned off before the player leaves the area as there is a slight chance that the flying machine can unfold or stop during the chunk loading while it's still running. But they are relatively simple to build and fix, and we don't have that many of them in this farm, so in the worst case scenario, if your game crashes, you might need to come over and fix one or two of them stuck on the floors, which I don't think is a big deal. They are much more fragile farms than this one. Collection-wise, we have 33,000 potential drops per hour to collect, and we drop mobs to one spot, so we cannot do that with a single hopper. That's why we need to use hopper minecarts. Here we have a simple version of this collector which distributes items that end up on this block evenly into these 8 hoppers which feed into 4 droppers which are connected to the fast 18,000 per hour clocks capable of dropping 72,000 items per hour. Unfortunately this solution because of the use of redstone torches and the quirks with their updating may cause the pistons to spit out their blocks which will lock the entire site. But with a steady use like with dropping items from a chest it's not a problem. Assembly of the minecarts is relatively easy. Once you have these 8 hoppers in this configuration, just place an end rod, glass panes and what have you, I prefer end rods for no reason, it's just my new favorite block in the game. In this configuration, then spawn 4 hopper minecarts, break the rails, and then notch them into the center. Then break the 4 blocks round, you can leave the one in the middle, 
and then drop 8 gravity blocks just to protect the minecart's position from being nudged by players. Then spawn 4 more hopper minecarts in the center and again cover them with all gravity blocks for protection. The system will work at full speed with just one minecart in the middle, but it won't be distributing evenly the items, so that's why we need 4. And that's it. In the actual farm I used one more minecart up top just to make room for the player AFK position, otherwise the player will be nudging the minecarts on the outside and that's no good. Also the final collection setup uses two tick repeaters that prevent pistons from losing the observers. It's a little bit bulkier but it's actually necessary. Also in all of these uh, I don't power the droppers blocks directly from uh, the observer clock but through a third observer because of some weird observer update issues, which may cause in some cases this clock when you push two observers into each other and make them click every 6 games, it's not 4, slowing down the dropper rates from 18,000 items per hour to 12,000 items per hour. In the middle I employed another trick which I learned from Tango Tech to use a cobweb which makes sure that items shoot off by the droppers drop down to the conveyor exactly within the block and not on the edge with some extra momentum which makes sure that we can control exactly when they land so they don't get stuck. The items are being pushed around, I just made sure that they are being aligned outside of the block for the sorters so they can be picked up by the sorting hoppers and that's it. Whatever doesn't find its place in the sorters just circles around until it spawns. So all sorts of sorts and other random crap. I've been seeing typically about 40 to 50 of them at a time, so it's not that bad in terms of the entity count. So that's the farm done. In terms of the tutorial, I just gave you the overview how and why it all works. So you should have no problem building it yourself. There is a world download in the description in case you need to count out blocks or whatnot. And if you are playing on other platforms and cannot run the world download, it won't help you either because the simple flying machines that the entire farm is based off only work on Java version of the game anyways. In all honesty, if you still don't know what's going on and I gave you a block by block tutorial, it's very likely that you would make a mistake and farm wouldn't work and you wouldn't even know how to fix it. What I will give you though is a bunch of tips how to build it. First, don't build your farm in the first nether fortress you find. This one doesn't require any crazy nether fortress for configuration and you'll be much better off trying a bunch of them to find a better location. You absolutely will need to remove all the spawning spaces outside of the farm for up to 120 blocks away from the player location, so this fortress for example here is really bad, this one is a little bit better but still quite miserable and this one is much much better. Since to find a perfect spot you will be running around and generating nether chunks like crazy, even if you allow yourself to use spectator for scouting out the areas in your own world or on a server, I'd highly encourage you to do it on a copy of the world or a fresh new world with the same seed. And the only reason is not to make your own world unnecessarily large. You would need the spectator test world anyways because now you'll need to find all the spawning spaces that are inside of the 128 block large sphere centered around where the player will AFK. And then either fill it up, blow it up, slab it up, button it up or cover it all with lava in the area within the sphere including all the caves that's why you need the spectator test world. If you miss one or two caves this farm will simply not work that good. Another advice, don't play on view distance of 8 chunks or less which is unfortunately the default. There are issues in the game that will stop mob spawning completely at some point when you are at 8 view distance. So set it up to 10 or higher and you'll be Gucci. You can remove all the blocks in the perimeter if you want and then you'll be able to make it work even with a smaller view distances but perimeter preparation in survival will take you much more time than simply building the farm which would defy the purpose of the simple farm design. While building it, it is very much so recommended to have some sort of a protection from other mobs, as nether mobs can be both annoying and destructive, like blazes or gusts. So even if you don't have any mob switch solution for the nether, if you play on a multiplayer world, ask your friend to afk on a blaze spawner and not to kill the blazes to keep other mobs from spawning in the nether. That's the easiest thing. But if you play on your own or you wouldn't mind to have a peaceful nether, I can recommend you play my previous survival episode when I have shown how you can pretty much pacify the entire nether with about 200 hoppers. If you don't want to prevent other mobs from spawning while you're building a farm, just brew some ridiculous numbers of fire resistant potions. This will make so that blaze attacks if they spawn while you're building would have just no impact at all on what you're doing. To build a farm, find the most suitable crossroad and the walkway level will be the same level as the middle packed ice platform centered on the crossroad. From this reference point you can build all the other platforms and the player access area 
If you don't have a mob switch, it makes sense to build a farm first and then spawn proof the area. Resource-wise, uh, for the farm itself, from the most important component standpoint, you need to prepare about 23 stacks of leaves for the size of the spawning pass at the bottom swiper, but most of them, apart from the blocks on the feet level, can be replaced with terracotta. But leaves are easier to acquire. I use here terracotta on the inside portions, just for the better look. You'll also want to have about a stack of those non-sticky blocks to be used at the return stations, so I recommend obsidian, but it doesn't have to be as most flying machines here are already at the push limit. But obsidian gives more security while building. Then you'll need about 15 stacks of blocks to build a shell around the farm. I used here glass because you can see inside what's going on and it looks better, but you could use a cobblestone or cobble stairs on the feet level as well if you want. From the 42 stacks of nether brick that went into this build, 16 stacks are mandatory for the spawning area and blocks immediately around them. The rest is for those balconies, so 14 stacks for the closer area and 12 for the outer edge, which is optional but recommended. These balconies would also require a total of 26 stacks of carpets or any slabs just to make them properly spawn proof that would also prevent the social spawning. For the spawning pads, you would also need 13 stacks of packed ice and 2 stacks of cobblestone walls. Redstone wise, you would need 4 stacks of slime blocks, a stack of observers, half a stack of redstone torches, redstone dust, repeaters, sticky pistons, 16 regular pistons, a stack of buttons to spawn proof the bottom pusher, 12 droppers, 2 stacks of slabs to put the redstone on top of it, and a lever lever to turn your farm on and off. To be honest, apart from the basic building blocks, it's pretty much basic resources and quite cheap to build, assuming you have access to all the packed ice early on. I'll leave the collection area up to you, but this one I built will be in the world download anyway, so you can use it if you want. Make sure that we have removed all the spawning spots in the spawning area around the player, like with any mob farms, so that your farm can work efficiently. Turn up your render distance to 10 or up, and don't even play on default 8, it's so bad none of your spawning farms will be working properly anyways. So if you enjoyed it or learned something new, don't forget to leave a like, and if you want to add something or have some questions, please use the comment section below. Subscribe for more if you haven't done it already, and see you in the next one. Bye bye!